Um, my name is Ngosa Kambashi. I am I specialize, well, my specialism is in forensic psychology. Um, I have a BSc in forensic psychology and a master's in forensic psychology. I'm also a member of the BPS, uh, which is the British Psychological Association as a graduate member. Um, and so today I will be talking about um, a mixed method approach to perceptions of male rape um, in England. Um, from a like psychological perspective, particularly um, in the context of health and uh, forensic psychology. Um, today, I will give you a brief introduction on um, what these perceptions are. And then I will talk about the challenges that I've faced in recruiting participants, because I think it's, uh, it's very important to acknowledge that um, when you're doing a PhD, it's not always gonna go well, particularly when you start um, recruiting during a global pandemic. So um, yeah, I'll get started. So what are perceptions of male rape? Perceptions of male rape are views on uh, men as victims of sexual violence. R literature on male rape myths has demonstrated that people may have an idea how, of how rape typically occurs. So the idea is that a stranger violently attacks a woman walking home alone at night. Um, a man being a victim of rape is a departure from this concept, um, this rape script as it's known. And this contradiction to the concept can lead to people believing false beliefs um, about male rape. Um, these false beliefs are also known as male rape myths, and they function to deny or minimize the survivor's experiences by shifting um, the blame or part of the blame from the rapist to the victim. This blame attribution is also informed by stereotypical beliefs surrounding uh, sex and gender roles, particularly um, surrounding um, concepts such as masculinities, so how people should are expected to behave depending on their stereotypical um, gender roles. And other concepts that can um, influence these views are homophobia, the law itself, and other belief systems. Um, so some of the myths that have been found in the UK is that all men should be able to avoid or prevent being raped. Um, the other one is only heterosexual men are the real victims of male rape. The victim must have behaved or appeared in a way that signified that he was gay. Um, so this is where the homophobia starts to come in um, when it comes to male survivors, which leads to the myth that because the victim is gay, they made up a false allegation to cover up um, cons uh, the, the consensual act. Um, which kind of suggests that it's, they would rather claim to be a victim than admit being gay, which is a very, very um, problematic view. So why do rape, um, perceptions of male rape matter? They matter because acceptance of these myths. So it's just to reiterate, anyone can be accepting of these uh, male rape myths. You might not even know, you might not be consciously doing it. But acceptance of these myths are damaging to survivors and wider society. And the reason why this matters is, um, I think one of my participants said it well, is if the, a part of our community is not okay, then we are all not okay. So this is why um, investigating the acceptance of rape myths is important to society and survivors. So the literature suggests that anyone can be accepting, as I said. This can lead to them reacting negatively to survivors who disclose their experience to them. These adverse reactions may result in secondary victimization of the survivor. So not only have they gone through this traumatic experience, they're now being re-victimized um, through people's reactions. They're receiving, instead of receiving support, they're receiving negativity and doubt. Um, and very, very detailed intrusive questions that can be re-traumatizing. Uh, re so this secondary victimization can lead the su uh, survivor to stop seeking uh, any help from support services, from law enforcement, 
and from friends or family. Um, so they can become quite isolated as well. Um, additionally, these survivors are, are members of wider society. So they are aware that these myths exist in society. Thus, they're not even likely to report the incident or seek any other forms of support. Um, this can contribute to the low reporting of rape um, in the UK. Um, and obviously the way the system works right now is because there's, it looks on paper like there aren't many male survivors, therefore there are not many service provisions that are available for male survivors. Um, local authorities are not seeing them as a priority uh, just based on the statistics. So this, this is why investigating these um, myths is important. So um, a critical issue within the discourse of male rape in England is the law itself. The law itself is gendered. So the Sexual Offences Act actually only applies to England and Wales. So um, this led to me initially, I wanted to look at male rape myths in the UK, but that's this has limited me now to England and Wales because this is the, as a forensic psychologist, um, of looking at the law and how that impl um, implicates in terms of real life is what is important to me as well as you know um, what I'll go on to talk about in a minute. So as you can see um, the Sexual Offences Act is very gendered only men can be perpetrators of rape and this may um, confuse male survivors they may not be uh, the be unsure of how to define their experience, particularly if the perpetrator was female. So as you can see, only men can be perpetrators of rape, but um, some women can uh, feel like they have been raped by women. They do not describe it as sexual assault as it appears in the law. To them, um, it's the same thing. So it's important um, to acknowledge these differences because some organizations will not deal with the serious crime of rape. They will deal with other, not necessarily lesser crimes, but less complicated crimes like sexual assault, which is where female perpetrators would fall. So um, unfortunately at the moment, uh, female perpetrators as offenses are downgraded to sexual assault by penetration or by forcing an individual to engage in a sexual act. So why it's important to acknowledge these differences in, is in the law is because uh, for rape, uh, the minimum sentence is four years and this can go up to life imprisonment. For um, sexual assault, the, the minimum sentence is community service to life imprisonment. So as you can see, there's already differences in the legal system and the legal discourses surrounding rape and sexual assault in the UK. And these can often fuel these rape myths that we see. So for example, some people may believe that men who have been raped by women um, aren't really affected by it because they should be ready to receive sex from a woman. Um, but there has been some research out there that's looked at it and they found it equally as traumatizing. So now I'm gonna move on to um, talking about my research. So my research is a mixed method approach to perceptions of male rape. It's an exploratory sequential mixed methods design. And what that means is I, it's exploratory in nature. And what it means is I first qualitatively investigate um, this issue. And then I use the results of the qualitative phases to influence the quantitative phases. So some of the um, things that I'm aiming to do is gain a greater understanding of perceptions of male rape myths through both qualitative and quantitative methodology. Um, and this will be done through three studies. So um, the first study will explore perceptions of male rape for, from professionals. Um, this has now, um, as PhD goes on, I remember the previous speaker was talking about this, things change. So initially I set out UK, 
but I was actually only able to recruit people from England. So now the scope of my research has gone from wide to small to now England. So um, it's evolving. In the second qualitative study, um, it was to explore survivors' perceptions of male rape myths. Um, again, this has been only being in England. So this is where the scope has gone smaller. Um, and I'll be exploring these and analyzing these using um, the theory of discourse, particularly um, informed by Foucauldian discourse analysis, Foucauldian theory, um, which focuses on how language perpetuates and uh, legitimizes power. And so um, through this, I will then use the results of that to examine the extent to which male rape myth acceptance ambivalent sexism, gender, and other personal characteristics and experiences can predict blame attribution in acquaintance rape. Now, the reason why I'm focusing on acquaintance rape is from the qualitative research, the theme that is coming up is that the perpetrator is almost always known to the victim in one way or another. And this is where the issue of consent starts to come into play. And this is where people can get confused. And this is where the, these rape myths may start to arise from. So currently I'm in the process of going through um, ethics for the third phase, I've done the first two phases. So I'm just now quickly gonna talk about the challenges that I've had in recruitment. So some of the challenges that I've had is I had to start my research during COVID-19. I initially set out for face-to-face -face interviews. This had to be changed to be online. Some other organizations says due to COVID-19, they did not have the resources to, able, to be able to facilitate my research um, at the time. Although I did follow up and I'm pleased to announce that some of them were able to help in the later months. So I initially started in September um, 2020 and in November, December, they were able, some of them were able to help. Um, but what also this did for me is it opened up my area. So initially I planned on focusing on Leicester, but what I was able to do is open it up to, uh, nationally. So I contacted over 120 charities and I received some support from around about 30. So um, so whilst there were some challenges, there was also some positives that came out of it. So briefly, um, I wanted to talk about the hard to reach. So it took me about six to four to six months to recruit 13 professionals for the professionals phase. It took me three months to recruit one survivor. So then I had to change the methods that I was using. I wanted to do an online um, interview. I had to then open that up as well to qualitative questionnaires because I realized maybe it was just too much for some survivors to commit to an hour long interview. And what I did as well is I opened it up. So I initially started with um, the charities that helped with the first phase. I also found different charities that just focused on sexual health rather than just um, a sexual abuse. I then spoke to other researchers who've researched the similar um, samples about also that I think the biggest thing that helped me was social media campaign was creating a website, a social media campaigns and making it very quick for people to access my research using QR codes. So through that, I've now been able to recruit seven participants. I'm still recruiting for this phase. So lastly, what I hope to do um, with the results of this research is really to create um, informative resources. So my plan is for social action, informative resources to bring awareness um, to rape myth acceptance and dispelling some of those myths is to be able to create tra um, training programs for service providers and any people who are interested. And another thing that I wanted to focus on is the campaigning. So with the education comes the campaigning. And that's really just bringing awareness uh, to uh, male rape myth acceptance. Um, and hopefully with more awareness comes more service, uh, service provisions for male survivors. 
So thank you very much for listening. And that is the end of my talk. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Um, this is my email. Um, sorry, I need to update it. That's the wrong one. But that's the website. Um, that is the, my academic Twitter, which is where I do most of my recruiting. And that's my LinkedIn.